I started my sort of journey on tissue repair in graduate school, looking at neuronal survival, and then moving towards spinal cord injury and repair. And um, even though, though I did a nine-year stint in intellectual properties, because that's kind of what you do in DC, um, I eventually found orthobiologics and was so intrigued with that that I made a career change and started with harvest technologies that focused on the therapeutic use of cells from adipose tissue, platelet-rich plasma, and bone marrow. And that's how I started to learn about the biological principles of bone healing. And that's why I'm here today, is to share with you some of those principles and what you should be thinking about when looking at options in orthobiologics. So how do I change the... Yeah, the right slide. So, oh. Here we go. There we go. The right okay. Button. That's just a statement that this presentation is for educational purposes only. So, who is BioVendis? You should probably know that in the world of orthobiologics, companies are coming and going, and I'm BioVendis is here to stay. We have a long history. We were the biologic division that branched off of Smith and Nephew. That happened in 2012, and the first transaction that we did was an exclusive license with Pfizer for their BMP portfolio. We retain the same scientific team in Cambridge, and they're working on the next generation designer BMP. We've got John Wozni, who cloned BMP2, and Sir Howard Zierman as advisors on this team. Since then, we've done a number of other transactions. We're building a wide portfolio of orthobiologics in the clinic setting, so that's where the ultrasound stimulator and hyaluronic acid injections, that's in the clinic side. And then the surgical side, now we've got orthobiologics in three different categories. I'll only gonna, I'm only going to show you one product slide, and that's at the very end. So again, this, is, this presentation is for educational purposes. And at BioVentus, we actually have a BioVentus Academy. It's online education for healthcare practitioners to learn about orthobiologics. And so I encourage you to visit, um, visit this website and learn more. But we're committed to stay. We're going to be a global leader in orthobiologics by offering differentiated technologies and providing fact-based evidence and support ongoing education. So for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to go through very high level the role of orthobiologics and highlight the biological features of each category. You're familiar already with this race between fixation and fusion. And the use of autograft in orthobiologics is to provide successful and hopefully complete fusion before the instrumentation fails. Autograft is considered the gold standard because it has all of the components of that stem cell microenvironment in the bone marrow that contributes to bone healing. It has all of the cells, not just the mesenchymal stem cells, the hematopoietic stem cells that give rise to the macrophages and the monocytes and the megakaryocytes. There's a whole, this milieu of growth factors. But who are the patients that where autograph may not work. We just saw a couple of cases. What type of orthobiologic are you going to use for that patient? So just keep that in mind as I go through these different categories. Orthobiologics aren't necessarily intended to completely be the end-all, be-all. They're intended to augment the patient's own ability to heal itself. In some cases, they'll overcome the complications associated with autograft. Orthobiologics are used in combination to su supplement local autograft. In some cases, there's evidence of equivalency to autograft. But there's so many different options, and they all have different unique properties. You've seen the essential properties of bone healing presented as a triad of the three O's. I submit to you a diamond approach. More than 250 years ago, Albrecht von Haller stated that you had to have a vascular supply before bone healing could occur. 
And so that's why I've added osteogenesis as another essential component to bone healing. And I'm going to use this diamond approach as I describe each of the categories of orthobiologics. And for this talk, we're going to be focusing orthobiologics in the world of bone grafts. Orthobiologics covers a wide variety of options that, that treat the musculoskeletal systems. But we're going to be talking primarily about bone graft options. So let's start with bone marrow, because this is still an autograft. It's providing osteogenic cells, osteoinductive signaling proteins, as well as angiogenic signaling proteins, but it lacks the scaffold. What is so unique about the bone marrow? Some of you may or may not know that within the bone marrow environment, there is low oxygen tension. And the cells in that environment produce hypoxia-inducing factor and stromal-derived factor one. This is a very potent chemoattractant, and it retains the stem cells within that environment. What happens during injury? That can be characterized as being hypoxic. And so the local cells at that site release stromal-derived factor one, and it actually mobilizes and recruits stem cells from the bone marrow to that site of repair. This is what your body is doing naturally. It has the ability to heal itself. And what you're doing when, you ca when you're taking bone marrow aspirate is you're capturing that healing potential and putting it in a more concentrated form at that site of repair. Arnold Kaplan, 30 years ago, highlighted the importance of the identity and numbers of responding cells that contribute to bone healing. But it was, it was Philippe Hernigo who demonstrated a clinical correlation between a high number of connective tissue progenitors from bone marrow concentrate to successful bone fusion and tibial nonunions. So the advantages, very quickly, of using bone marrow aspirate is that it is autologous and it provides the heterogeneous mix of cells and signals. And there are a number of clinical studies that I could talk to you about demonstrating the effective use of bone marrow. The disadvantages in this category is that there are many different aspiration needles and different concentration systems. So Joe Lane at HSS has probably the best study where he compared head to head three different bone marrow concentration systems. The aspiration needles, what's new about um, in this space is that they've gone away from a traditional jam sheety to closing off that distal port, and they have, there's open side ports, so you're gathering stem cells from a unique and different place each time you're aspirating, and that falls in line with George Mushler's theory that the best quality of bone marrow is those first one to two cc's. Now I'm going to move from autograph to allografts. We know that this is human bone, so it's offering a very, you know, it's offering that natural osteoconductive scaffold. There's a lot of literature supporting that allografts retain growth factors that are osteoinductive. There's been plenty of animal studies demonstrating osteoinductivity. And now some of the allografts are detecting the presence of angiogenic growth factors. So that's why that part of the diamond is not in bold, because they're just some of the um, companies ranking allografts or processing allografts are just sort of starting to look at that. <clears throat> You're all familiar with the different formats, the chips and the chunks and the strips and the blocks. Um, but what's new in this space is now you're seeing fiber formats, um, which are moldable. You can pack them and they'll stay together. You're n you already know about demineralized bone matrix. This is the most, um, this is the this has extensive processing that removes the mineral composition and exposes the growth factors. 
And what's different or what's new about this space, because there's not a whole lot more we can do with um, manipulating to, or falling within the minimal manipulation category, what's new is that they're trying to move into more content of bone and less carrier. The carrier is used to provide better handling characteristics, um, but we want to move towards more bone and less carrier, but still maintaining that handling property. So quickly, the advantages of allografts. There is the presence of osteoinductive proteins. New formats are coming out and improved handling characteristics. The disadvantages or the challenges that are faced, we're not so worried about the risk of disease transmission anymore. Now it's more about the availability of donors. Do we have enough donors to provide enough allografts needed in the market? And then there's also the concern about age. The, does the growth factor content from a donor who's 80 look the same as a donor who's 20? Probably not. But through the different types of processing techniques that the tissue banks have been developing and improving along the way, those techniques can still expose the growth factor content in the donors. So now let's move to stem cell allografts. The intention of this category was to mimic all the biological features of autograft, but in an allograft format. You have an osteoconductive scaffold, you've got viable osteogenic cells, osteoinductive proteins, and some of the stem cell allografts on the market have demonstrated the presence of angiogenic growth factors. What's the rationale for using stem cell allografts? We know that there is this dramatic decline of mesenchymal stem cells as we age. In this graph, you can see on the left that for every 10,000 bone marrow cell in the newborn, one of those is a mesenchymal stem cell. By the time we get to the age of 30, that's dropped down to one in every 250,000. So the assumption is if we add more cells, we'll make more bone. That's kind of the premise of using concentrated bone marrow. But do we know the fate of these cells that have been transplanted? To date, there really have not been any traceability studies showing what that fate is and what they're doing. Are they remaining a lot viable once they've been transplanted? Are they really truly differentiating an osteoblast once in vivo? Perhaps they're providing those, perhaps they're, they're providing trophic support. Arnold Kaplan said that these really should be called medicinal signaling cells because the role that they play in the first stages of bone healing. Another assumption that you've probably heard in this space is, well, there's no clinical evidence to support their use. You probably could have said that six years ago. But look at the number of studies that have been published in the last six years. So the truth is, there are clinical studies that have been published on the use of stem cell allografts. But the question is, what is the clinical outcomes? What are, what's the difference in fusion rates? Have they demonstrated superiority or clinical effectiveness? So the advantages of using stem cell allografts is that there are viable osteogenic cells. The tissue banks are targeting the younger population of donors. And the, the, as stem cell allografts have evolved from chunks, now they are also providing fibers or moldable formats. Some of the challenges in this space is I've already described the fate of the transplanted cells. And then cell counts. When they first came on the market, stem cell allografts said, we've got 1,000 cells per cc. And then you heard, we've got 100,000. And now there's 250,000. And the latest one is 750,000 cells. So they're, there's, they're always trying to one-up each other on the number of cells that are in their stem cell allografts. Does that make a difference clinically? We know that also that there's a high cost associated with them. 
and a little bit of challenges with the storage and thawing processes. So I've gone through autographs and allographs, and now I'm going to move into synthetics. So by a show of hand, how many of you have used a synthetic as a bone graft? A few of you. We know that, obviously, they provide a good scaffold. But what has, um, what's new about this is that synthetics have evolved from first generation to second generation and third generation. And as they've evolved, they've demonstrated bioactive and osteostimulatory effects that support osteoinduction. Synthetics are composed of primarily bioglass or ceramics. There's typically a polymer added to provide better handling characteristics. And as these synthetics have evolved, now what you see is a combination of several different compositions. The porosity um, in the synthetics can be optimized to provide the best the best scaffold for cell migration and nutrient exchange. But with porosity comes a give and take with the mechanical properties. Then you also need to be concerned about biodegradability. Hydroxyapatite can last for many years. Bioactive glass hangs around for a few months, sometimes a few weeks. And then the ceramics, the calcium phosphates, typically last from six to nine months. So as, I, so as I mentioned, the evolution of synthetics have looked at all of these different features, and what you're seeing is combinations of one synthetic will have bioactive glass, calcium phosphate, and, and hydroxyapatite all together, and sometimes they're even combined with collagen. So they're trying to optimize the best scaffold that can be used as a, bio, as a bone graft. But they're not just providing a scaffold. There's actually literature supporting and demonstrating that they are actively playing a role in bone healing. This is, um, this is just sort of a, a flow chart of what's happening. When synthetics are exposed to the, the body's fluid, there's this ion exchange. And what's, that ion exchange does two things. It's going to trigger the crystallization of amorphous calcium phosphate groups to this hydroxycarbonate appetite layer at that interface, which recruits stem cells. And then those stem cells start to lay down osteoid matrix at that interface. But what's also been demonstrated is that ion exchange will actually influence gene expression and trigger the differentiation of cells into osteoblasts. So again, synthetics are playing this active role in bone healing. They have probably some of the best handling characteristics. And there are a number of clinical studies. Synthetics have been used for a long time. The disadvantages are going to be all those variations of different resorption rates, which can lead to variable clinical evidence. So last category I'm going to talk about are growth factors. These are recombinant proteins combined with a scaffold, and, but they're only going to be working through one signaling pathway. And so that's why um, each of those sides of the diamonds is not in bold. So we know that the current BMP2 on the market is combined with the bovine collagen and it's going to function through that BMP2 signaling pathway. It will support chemotaxis and proliferation. It supports and directs the differentiation of stem cells into osteoblasts. But BMP2 also pro promotes the entire bone formation process. And it will actually promote osteoclastic activity. PDGF, platelet-derived growth factor is another option in this category. It's combined with a synthetic scaffold. And it also functions 
through chemotaxis and proliferation, but it's regulating VEGF. So it's working through the angiogenic pathway. And then I just wanted to um, remind you again that BioVentus is working on the next BioBetter BMP. So in a few years, you'll, you'll start to hear some, some noise about that. Um, so I think there's plenty of um, growth in this category. Um, but given the concerns um, with the use of BMP2 um, at those su that super physiological level, we just need to be a little more careful. So um, again, um, you know, these growth factors are readily available, so that's, the, that's actually an advantage. Because they are considered to be a drug, there's randomized controlled trials to support their use. Um, but again, it's, they're working primarily through one signaling pathway. So this is just a summary of what I've been through um, on a very high level. We've gone through all these green check marks, and I just want to point out that the, the purple smaller check marks for allografts and stem cell allografts is that there's only a few that are recognizing and, and basically um, demonstrating the presence of angiogenic growth factors. And then for synthetics, there's a little check mark in osteoinduction because from the biologists, they're saying that's not really truly osteoinductive, um, but they support osteoinduction. And then for growth factors, again, they're either going to offer, you know, an osteoinductive pathway or an angiogenic pathway. So in reviewing how orthobiologics augment bone healing, I hope you're thinking about what type of orthobiologic would I use if I chose not to use autograph, and how would those specific biological features match up with the specific biological needs of a patient. Um, last slide before I end. This is um, our surgical portfolio at BioVentus. You can see that we've got several different options in the allograft, cell marrow, and synthetic category. So thank you very much for your time. And uh, I'll entertain any questions.